Good afternoon and welcome to IPI's policy event today. My name is Tom Giovanetti. I'm the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation. If you're not familiar with us, we are a 34 year old free market policy think tank based in Dallas, Texas. Our Zoom discussion today is entitled A Leaner, Meaner Fighting Machine, a conversation with the Pentagon's former chief management officer, Lisa Hirschman. We appreciate you all being with us. We especially appreciate those of you who are IPI supporters. We very much appreciate your support. Your support makes it possible for us to do events like this as well as everything else that we do. And so we do deeply appreciate your support. Uh, if you would like to become a supporter of IPI, uh, you can contact Addie Crimmins at IPI. Her email address is Addie at IPI.org and she would be delighted to speak with you. Today's event for those of you, for those rare of you out there who are not burned out on Zoom by now. Today's <laughs> event is a Zoom webinar, not a meeting. And so only the discussants and only the speaker is on video. Uh, we will be happy to take your questions for our speaker and we'll get to as many of them as we can. But we would ask that you enter them using the Q&A function in the menu bar down at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, some of you may be in the habit of using the raise your hand function to ask a question. Some of you may be in the habit of using chat. I mean, if you do that, we'll try to get to those, but we will prioritize any question that's in the Q&A. So help us out with that. Okay, so now let's get on with our program. Here we go, Lisa. We've all heard about the $10,000 toilets and the $600 hammers <laughs> procured by the Defense Department. We've all heard about the supposed fact that it's impossible for the Pentagon to pass an audit and that no one knows where all the money's going, uh, even though defense is our largest and most important area of, of federal spending. The Trump administration brought in Lisa Hirschman, an expert on business transformation and reform to bring her expertise to the Defense Department. And in her three years there, she accomplished tremendous things. She was also significantly the highest ranking woman ever confirmed by the US Senate to a Defense Department position. Now, Lisa has sent us her extremely impressive three page biography, but I know that no one, including Lisa, wants me to read a three page <laughs> bio here on this Zoom event. So I'll just try to hit some of the highlights. Uh, upon Lisa's departure in January, she was awarded the Distinguished Public Service Medal, the highest civilian honor awarded by the Department of Defense. She was also honored by having a room at the Pentagon named in her honor, the first room in the history of the Pentagon to be officially named after a woman. A few more highlights. And I'm sure Lisa, these are some of the things you're gonna talk, talk about, so I don't wanna take away um, the main message of the event. Uh, but while at the Department of Defense, she achieved more than 37 billion in reform savings in less than three years. She identified and slated for elimination over 200 federal regulations deemed unnecessary or outdated. And she successfully completed the first unified budget build of agencies in the history of the Department of Defense. Were that not enough, she is also the co-author of a book called Faster, Cheaper, Better, The Nine Levers for Transforming How Work Gets Done, which received critical acclaim and has been translated and sold in 13 countries. Uh, Lisa, as you know, um, I worked on policy issues with your husband, Brent, several years ago. And I have to say, reading your biography, you are at least as accomplished as Brent, if not more so. <laughs> and I know that he, and I know that, I know that he's proud of you. And uh, you're, you're a very impressive couple. And uh, for those of us who believe in limited government and free markets and a strong defense, you were right there at the intersection of all of those things. So we would love to hear about your experience, your accomplishments, what you learned from your first ever, I believe, government service, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so well, we would we would love we would love to hear from you, and then we'll I'm sure we'll have a vigorous Q and A afterward. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me uh, to you, and I really can't say enough about all the wonderful things that IPI does, and in you know, absolutely appreciate you saying the, the kind words, especially since I know my husband is listening. So thank you for that. Okay, good. <laughs> it's been quite a journey and you're right. Let, let me just share a little bit about my background. 
um, and and I'll walk you through how I got to where I was in government because it's not intuitive. So I have a background in engineering. As you mentioned, I co-authored a book on transformation and I've had the privilege of working in the private sector my entire career for Fortune 100 companies or with Fortune 100 companies. At one point I had as a client listing about 75% of the Fortune 100. So I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of different organizations, how they're run, their business models, their best practices that they put in place, what's effective, what's not, et cetera. So you're probably asking yourself, how in the world did I get to DOD? And sometimes I ask myself that question. The chief management officer role very unusually, it, it was stood up uh, in that capacity officially on February 1 of 2018. Prior to that, they had other, uh, they had a lesser role called the deputy chief management officer. But after 10 years of trying the role of having it vacant for about 60% of the time, it was not able to get anywhere. And they had a lot of good people folks from either in the building or previous congressional staffers that filled the role. But, and these are good people, but they just didn't necessarily have uh, large scale reform experience. So the Congress went ahead and wrote legislation that says, we're gonna make it a top, a top position. So it's the number three position in the Department of Defense. So you have the Secretary of Defense, the deputy secretary, and then the chief management officer. So it had a lot of clout, which is necessary for anybody out there who's run any level of transformation, you know, either you have to have that or you're, you have to have a high level sponsor. By law, they, in statute, they mandated that the person who fills the role has a minimum of seven years private sector experience specific to large scale reform. I had the privilege of working in the tech sector where I ran reform in 72 countries, which helped me understand size, scale, and even pockets of different cultures and how to enact reform and transformation and modernization, uh, depending on either the culture, the budget, the approach, the business model, et cetera. So Congress got it right. And the way they made, they gave it authority, they gave it, um, clout, I uh, was responsible for reform across all of DOD, and that included the ability when it came to business operations or reform matters, I actually had the authority to overrule the Secretary of the Army, Secretary of the Navy, and the Secretary of the Air Force. Now, I often get the question, did you? And I gleefully say, I didn't have to, because they were great people, many of them had private sector experience, they knew how to work together to get to yes. And many of them had run organizations that also required some level of transformation or modernization. And so they were wonderful to work with. So the role, uh, believe it or not, DOD has been struggling with reform and it's been a, a priority for a very long time. As far back as 1941, when the Truman Committee was assembled, it went from 1941 to 1948 with a recognition that we want to be mindful and good stewards of taxpayer dollars in order to ensure that our hardworking men and women of the military are getting all of the equipment, supplies, weapons, et cetera, that they need to effectively defend our nation. So this has been something that's been top of mind for a long time. And a lot of different iterations with how to do this have been tried with actually fairly meager results. I'm incredibly proud of the team that we put together within the chief uh, management office. And we were able to accomplish some pretty significant things. Uh, um, you know, for one thing, as you mentioned, um, 37 billion was booked, validated, and I'm very proud to say that every dime that we found went directly back to the warfighter or to high priorities such as investment in hypersonic and advanced weapon systems. Now that's a great 
I mean, the, the, the hard work that happened within the building, uh, my team in particular, and the leadership within the team was just stunning. And, and frankly, there were a lot of people that couldn't believe that we were producing those kind of numbers. Thankfully, uh, we had the GAO that came in and validated. Now, none of this was easy. Um, and, and by the way, when I, when I talk about reform, um, most people within DOD think of reform equaling cuts. And that was, it, it's, it's not just that. We were looking to modernize a lot of our functions, modernize a lot of our approaches too. So it was, it was a challenge from the beginning. And as I said, I came from the private sector. And let me tell you what my first day in the Pentagon was like. Uh, I walked in and I think I was the only person walking into that building who never knew anybody. I never served in the military. I'd never worked in government before. I did a little bit of contracting work for the government. In fact, some of DOD's agencies but I knew absolutely no one. And even as an appointee, other appointees knew each other from previous administrations, but I didn't. Luckily, I had the, and, and let me give you this, uh, a little bit of a context when we talk about- so, so you were literally like the definition of an outsider. Oh, huge. In. huge. Yeah. Um, and, and, and let me give you an idea of, of how, intimidating it can be. I mean, for many of you probably know, we have over a $700 billion budget. And when you walk in the building itself, it's, it's huge. It's 25,000 people pre-COVID showed up to work there every day. If you walk all the corridors, it's over 17 miles. There's 284 bathrooms. And the Department of Defense has an the 19th largest economy in the world. So when you think about the scale and the breadth, it's, it's pretty mind boggling. Luckily, I had the uh, wonderful fortune of, as I said, running reform in 72 countries. I just walked in and said to myself, you need to treat this like you're going to another country. They have their own customs, their own language. They, spree they speak acronyms and that they literally have customs. Everything there is centered around your rank and where you are in the hierarchy. Even I used to ask my military assistants to teach me all of these nuances. Even walking down the hallway, the highest ranking person is always the farthest to the right. And so it's those little things that make the, the Department of Defense have an extraordinary culture. When I first started, uh, my first week on the job, when I first met then Deputy Secretary Shanahan, he said to me, Lisa, everyone says we need to change the culture. What do you think? I said, your culture is one of your greatest assets. You need to learn how to leverage it. Change your practices, change your policies, change your processes, change your metrics, but do so in a way where you leverage the strength of your culture. So it's a very unique place. And like I said, it was a real privilege to be working there. So yes, it was, uh, it was interesting uh, first day on the job. Many people ask me, you mentioned Tom, it was, uh, I was the highest ranking um, Senate confirmed woman. Uh, that actually wonderfully, I've been, uh, that role has been overtaken. We now have a Senate confirmed female deputy secretary. Kath Hicks. So I'm actually glad that someone else was able to take it one notch higher. Uh, but, you know, it was interesting because I often get asked, were you treated differently because you were a woman? And I would have to say, no, I was actually treated differently because I had never served and I came from the private sector and I was running essentially the largest change management program probably in the world. And as many of you know, change is hard. And so a lot of the pushback had less to do with my gender and more uh, about those other things that I mentioned, which was uh, you had to have some finesse uh, to try and overcome them. So um, I know that when uh, I, I had asked what might be on some of your viewers' minds in terms of you know, what, 
you know, what was the role like and, and, and some of the things that they wanted to hear about. You're right, we were able to accomplish some significant things. And, and let me tell you the pluses and the minuses. We accomplished 37 billion in book savings, but the sad part is we actually had identified 43 billion. Six billion dollars was left on the on the you know on the table that nobody wanted to enact because change is hard. It meant that it would impact people's budgets, potentially headcount, et cetera, and so that made it um, a bit challenging. But you know there have been attempts in the past, and one of the things you mentioned that some of your viewers might be interested in hearing is about sequestration. Um, didn't that sort of raise the flag around modifying spending behaviors and, and um, did, was it effective? Uh, the question that you also have to ask is, did it hurt our military? And the answer to that, from my opinion and viewpoint is yes, it hurt our military. Because um, what, what it tried to do, accomplish was in enforcing Congress to make thoughtful decisions about where, the, how and where the money is spent. Uh, unfortunately, um, that didn't necessarily happen. And what happened is in the implementation, it led to across the board cuts. And personally, I never think that's a good idea. And that's whether you're in government or whether you're in private sector, that's very difficult. You know, in the private sector, if I were sitting on a board of directors and the CEO came to a board meeting and said, I need to make across the board cuts, my first reaction would be, I don't think you understand the business. Because there are some areas that may need to be cut, but there are some areas that, that require significant investment, depending on what value you're trying to create for your stakeholders. And so I always looked at myself and my role as my two key constituencies were the men and women of the military, the warfighter, and the taxpayers. So everything I did was through the approach of how do I, how am I making sure we're good stewards of those taxpayer dollars and making sure our brave men and women are getting everything they need to protect our nation. And so when you're looking at across the board cuts, I'll give you an example. We had a program office that managed IED detection. Well, that was a big issue many, many years ago, but we've largely eradicated that. Across the board cuts would have meant that that program office may have received a cut, but hypersonics research may, would have then also had the same amount. It doesn't make sense. It, because the need for IED detection has gone down, but the need for advanced weapon systems has gone up across the boards could potentially do more harm than good. And so, as you mentioned, and it, it may seem uh, rather laughable to those who say the first ever consolidated budget, when you have 20, everything that's not Army, Navy, and Air Force, we refer to as the fourth estate. There are 28 defense agencies and field activities called the fourth estate. They all had their own budgets. And that includes everything from intel to research and engineering to logistics and supply chain, all of those organizations. And so those, we are things, those are things like DARPA and things like that? That's exactly it. Okay. So how I was able to do that was when Secretary Esper was put in place, he called me in and he said, Lisa, I think the CMO can do more than just the reform and the business operations. I'm used to dealing, since he was the Secretary of the Army, he said, I'm used to dealing with the Secretary of the Army, Navy, Air Force. But when I get to these defense agencies and field activities, I get to deal with 28 different leaders. I want you to be the Secretary of the Fourth Estate. So that was a role that I took on in January of uh, 2020 when he, um, shortly after he became the Secretary of Defense. So that's how we were able that, to, just to give you again for context for your um, listeners, that is about a $160 billion budget and over 100,000 people. So it was a, 
uh, again, scale matters and uh, being able to have that fight over those organizations was really eye-opening. And um, we were able to detect, and when you hear about reform, and Tom, you mentioned some of the most famous examples of, of waste and so forth. Uh, and I, when you and I were talking earlier, it it's, becomes a little bit easier to understand is how you get in those situations when you have 45,000 people that are contracting officers. So think about it, 45,000 people have the ability to put, an put in place and implement contracts that stem from batteries to orange juice to weapon systems. We have 2,500 contracting offices. We have 355 cloud initiatives. We have 64 CIOs. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's helping folks understand the complexity. It's really running a small country However, business practices definitely have a place and, and you can learn a lot from the private sector in implementing approaches that they've already proven out where DOD could learn from that. And we were really, you know, you think about DOD runs hospital systems, uh, major, major healthcare network and, and large hospitals. Uh, there are, we run grocery stores and we call them commissaries and we have a, a huge network. And, 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 you know, I said earlier that reform was often in the building seen as just cuts. While cuts are necessary, they're not the only way to reform and we should, you can't cut your way to prosperity. You have to do things differently and you have to modernize what you're doing. Grocery stores are a great example. Yeah, we could consolidate. Co I mentioned contracts. We, we had 27 different brands of apple juice that our grocery stores carried. Seven of them comprised about 90% of the sales. Just in one other agency, we had 31 separate contracts for orange juice with two vendors. So now you see the opportunity where, yes, you can consolidate, you can maybe make some cuts, you can leverage your buying power, you can get a better, uh, you can get more value for dollars if you do those things. The, the um, commissaries carry 1.4 million unique item numbers. A million of them don't produce more than $1,000 in revenue every year. But here's the problem. We are, have been trying to modernize those grocery stores for about 30 years. But Congress keeps wanting us to study what's the business case for making changes. And we are studying, we've done, I think the last count was 18 separate studies to look at how we can run our grocery stores more efficiently and more effectively while meeting the customer needs. And they still want us to study. We should be done studying. They've limited us with modernizing. We did a pilot over a year ago, something called click to go Crazy concept, ordering online, going to the commissary to pick up your groceries. When people go to the commissaries, the average value of the basket was about $68. When they ordered online and then went and picked it up, it was almost $400. Huge improvement, big convenience to the, those who are shopping. But we were only limited to testing it in a certain number of locations and then COVID hit. And those kinds of limit, those kind of limitations are literally written into law through Congress. Yes. Wow. They they will require a study before they will allow us to do uh, certain things. And what was real, you know, my when COVID hit, I, my military uh, assistants, their families were trying to get things at the commissary, and they said, "Can we order online?" They said, "You absolutely can." They said, "Great. When can we pick it up?" And they said, five days." <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, no. so 
you know, these are the things. And, and business practices, looking at grocery stores and the way the market is going, we keep trying to tell ourselves, but we're, you know, we're running grocery stores for the military. We're different. We're really not. We're losing people going into the stores because there are not as many people are living on the bases anymore. They want to live off base, the newer, the younger generations. And so we are following the same trends as the private sector with regard to retail uh, purchasing. So we're not that different, but there is such a cry for modernization that we are woefully behind the eight ball. People are going to other op options and therefore we're investing money into these commissaries and exchanges and not actually getting the value and not satisfying our customers. The customer experience is hurting. And I, and I think that's really an important point that you make because we tend to think about these things as just purely about saving taxpayer dollars or whatever, but we also wanna give you know, our military folks as 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 good of experience of life as possible, right? And and as many can be. I mean, they make so many sacrifices to be in the military. They shouldn't be deprived of just some of the conveniences and niceties of life unnecessarily. You absolutely. We want to make their life easier. One of the biggest reform initiatives we had going on was movement of household goods. It's when our poor. I had a, a lady that worked for me. She was a military spouse. They've moved nineteen times. That's not unusual. The moving process was miserable. We used to always look at lowest bidder. Nobody had a quality metric as part of the evaluation of who to select to move people's personal effects. When we, that comes something that I learned very early on in my days in GE is to think about a quality metric in addition to the best value. When we put that in place, we started seeing the number of claims go down. And when we looked at the whole process from one end to the other, we made a much better process, more efficient process. But there, you know, it's still a struggle when you're putting in a new technology platform and your leadership decides that an 18 year implementation timeline at $1.7 billion is a good idea. When if you looked at the size of the organization compared to a similar size organization in the private sector that should take three to five years and no more than $800 million, it's hard to get them to think that there's a better option. And sadly, they took the first steps in the FY22 budget to fund an 18 year technology platform and implementation plan at a total cost of $1.7 billion. So it, it sounds like the understatement of the year is that Congress micromanages things like that. You bet, you bet. But you know what? I, I don't wanna point the finger solely at Congress and I'm to be fairly blunt here. Yes, they do. But I remember talking to a high ranking official at the DOD that was complaining about Congress micromanaging. And I like to give examples. Let me give you all an example. I actually thought when my team was telling me about the law that required DOD to have cross-functional teams, I thought they were pulling my leg. And they said, we're not kidding. And I said, they had to mandate that? You know, common, uh, you know, business practices would you know, we've been using cross-functional and multidisciplinary teams for a long time and Congress had to mandate it. But I was having this conversation with an official that was complaining about Congress. And I said, no, no, you don't. You can't have it both ways because the first time you want something for one of your initiatives, you go running up to Congress and ask them and you hand them the pre-written language that you want in the bill. And that's how we get to a National Defense Authorization Act that is in the thousands and thousands and thousands of pages which is unbelievable to me because it starts to fly in the face of the usefulness of our national defense strategy. If it were me, I'd require the National Defense Authorization Act to be written in about three or four sections. The first three ought to align with three lines of effort from the national defense strategy. 
And maybe the fourth one is about emerging threats. But those, yes, you're right. Congress, you know, it's, it's almost a, a dysfunctional or unhealthy relationship because we ask for certain specificity and then when they give it to us, we complain that they're micromanaging, you know, but so, both. So it's almost like earmarks gone wild, right? So yeah. You, you, yeah, you've got people from the Pentagon going and finding a congressional sponsor for a certain thing, and then it becomes mandated. You bet, hmm. you bet. And, and think about it. When you come from the private sector, you're used to a board of directors. And while I tried hard to think about Congress that way, it was really more along the lines of 535 CEOs. Mm. Everybody had a different viewpoint and everybody had a, a different need. And I'm not saying they're not legitimate, but managing that uh, in that, if you think of how the, the, the way they acted was more like CEOs, that makes it uh, very, very difficult. It's, mm. it's complicated to be able to manage that way. But we were doing some great things. And I mean, we made the cuts. We found actually the 6 billion that I mentioned that was left on the table, the exact number was 6.2 billion. And uh, over uh, 4.9 billion of that came from no cuts. Mm -hmm. It all came from modernization and con managing our contracts better. Um, so we were doing some great things. I remember when General Raymond's from the Space Force came to me and he said, Lisa, I want you to help me set up Space Force in a whole new way. I want to use private sector approach. I want to use lean startup. Because if we take the template that we use at DOD, I'm fearful we will have more overhead than we need from day one. And I said, General, you had me at hello. Um, yeah, no, no, that that's that's a wonderful anecdote. We we actually are starting to do a little work on space policy here. And of course, one of the ingenious things about what NASA's doing is they're moving from this sort of defense contractor cost plus model on everything to mm -hmm. like fixed costs yeah. for acquisitions and things like that. And uh, you know, I, it's very encouraging to me to hear that you know, in the startup of a new branch of the military, there was at least some new and innovative thinking along those lines. Absolutely. And I, I said to him, I am so excited that you asked for this. And you, know, you mentioned the different approaches to contracting. There shouldn't be a one size fits all because if you don't have the uh, outcomes and specificity around the outcomes you intend, you've got to be careful about fixed costs because you may not get the quality levels and so forth. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we were also doing was introdu introducing outcomes metrics and a balanced scorecard. So you look at the customer's viewpoint, you're looking at cost, you're looking at investment, you're looking at return, you're looking at a balance. We even, for our medical teams, we introduced the patient experience as a key metric to make sure that we did not degrade, degrade care for the folks that are coming to our hospitals and through our medical system. Now, when you talk about your medical system, you're not talking about the VA, right? No, no. Yeah, the VA is totally separate. It's totally separate government yeah. agency. And we right. did a lot of you know, collaboration and benchmarking, especially through COVID. Uh, but we run hospitals. We have a huge um, defense health agency that manages things like insurances and so forth. And then my team actually ran to uh, retirement homes. So we have the Armed Forces Retirement Home with two locations, one in DC and one in Gulfport for, with about 703 residents. So mm. we got into several aspects of, uh, of healthcare. Hmm. So you, I thought it was very interesting when you talked about the fact that you, you were received very well as a woman, as a high ranking woman coming into the Pentagon and that that was not the primary culture clash. The primary culture clash was the fact that you were not military. Um, right. But there's another culture clash, clash that happens a lot of times. I mean, everybody says they want to find waste, fraud, and abuse. Dr. Matthews has done a lot of work on this in the healthcare area. And he has documented any number of situations where 
you know, states would bring in an outside firm or they would create a new position within the government to try to, uh, to, to create, to gain greater efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And when they actually start gaining efficiencies, they find that they're just making enemies. Yes. <laughs> and very often those efforts get terminated. Yes. Uh, how much of your experience was along those lines? Uh, very similar. And Dr. Matthews spot on. And I experienced many of the same things. It's unfortunate. And here's where I, I was extolling the virtues of the culture, but that doesn't mean it's perfect. And some of the downsides of the culture is that people uh, gauge their um, accomplishments, their stature based on the size of the budget and the number of headcount. And again, this is not necessarily unique to government or even DOD. I ran across this in the private sector as well, but it can, becomes incredibly challenging because we may have to take something from one area. So when I talked about the program office that looked at IED detection, how great would it be if I could take those talented people and maybe up, give them some new skills and put them in an area where there's advancement, but I've got to take from someone and give, to some, give it to someone else. And that creates all kinds of consternation. And that's usually when suddenly you get a call from a member of Congress that says, I'm hearing that you're standing this down and, you know, you, you can understand the process from there. So it was incredibly common. And, you know, there were a lot of um, folks were gauging the effective, they were gauging the viability of having this chief management officer role. And unfortunately, as I said to you before, I tried to view my role as serving two constituencies, and that's the warfighter and the taxpayer. But when they did the popularity poll, they didn't ask either one of those constituencies. They talked about the people who would be impacted, who would have to feel the change and maybe give something up. And so, yes, I experienced exactly what Dr. Matthews found. Those that were impacted by the change would usually create the greatest amount of pushback. Mm -hmm. There's a way to solve that. And we were on our way to doing that. It's um, at one point when they were creating the role, they contemplated having the CMO sign a contract for five to seven years to try to guarantee that you might go through a transition and not miss any of the work that's been done. But one of the things we were trying to do is shift everyone to shared outcome metrics so that it shouldn't have been just my metric on how much we save, but think about if all my senior leader peers were held accountable to the same metrics, it could have been a very different story. There is something inherently problematic about a position like that being a political appointee, right? Because I mean, you, you only had three years, right? And as you say, you know, I mean, to see everything through, you would probably need seven to 10 years yes. to, to actually, you know, really transform things. Yes. Yeah. And what we tried to do from day one is immediately with every initiative, try to think about the sustainment. For instance, when we were training all of those contracting officers to negotiate and look at contracts differently, we introduced experiential learning. So we had consultants who were very good in this space sitting down for 90 days and doing immersion training. But when they left, I said to them, part of your contract, I'm not interested in you being an annuity. I said that to the contractors. I said, the parting gift is number one, you do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people, experiential learning, but you also leave behind training modules so that we can scale this and we do a knowledge transfer. So those were some of the things we thought about, but there was still plenty of good work left to be done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So my understanding, from what you said is that essentially you were the first person to occupy a newly created position. I was actually the second. 
Okay. Okay. All right. But so, but it was a relatively newly created position and it was yes. given very high ranking. And so for those of us who would like to see cost savings and efficiencies in government, that's very encouraging. But it's also my understanding that something happened to that position when you left. Is that right? Was that, do I understand correctly that that position was eliminated? That, that's correct. Very, very unfortunately, it was eliminated. So for, for a relatively brief period of time, a high ranking position with authority was created in order to make these improvements at the Pentagon and then it was done away with. Why was it done away with? Did you wrinkle too, did you uh, ruffle too many feathers? Yeah, absolutely. Change is hard. Mm -hmm. And we were, you know, we had a, a pretty significant imperative. And that was we needed to put heavy investment in certain areas to ensure that we have, uh, as a country, uh, d dominance when it comes to our adversaries. But getting that done is sometimes requires sacrifice. It sometimes requires some very strict scrutiny of priorities. And as I mentioned before, it may mean taking resources from one organization and putting it into another, and that's incredibly uncomfortable. So those that were either, that were impacted by those changes, usually those that were losing something became very vocal about it. Again, they never asked, um, number one, I was never asked to testify in front of Congress. Mm. So the, you know, the, our results were staggering. We delivered 6x more than every one of the predecessor roles. In we, we delivered six times more in under three years what all the predecessors combined had done over 10. And so the results were there, and it was just mind-boggling to everyone as to why this would be, uh, why it would be eliminated. And we had a whole lot of taxpayer advocacy groups that were up in arms over this mm -hmm. because they saw those validated real dollar savings that were being put to better use. And if you look what's happening now, there's fights over what that budget number should be. You know, at one point there was a fight in Congress where it was, you know, some were advocating for 705 billion, others were advocating for 750 billion. Well, what's the difference about, you know, 45 billion, which is close to the, remember I said 43 billion if they didn't walk away from six, right. could have made the difference. So just because you have a budget doesn't mean you're using the money to its best higher use in terms of getting value to support our national defense strategy. Sure. Well, you know, you know, as a as an American who is looking down the road and seeing a possible conflict with China down the road at some point in the future, hopefully not, but possible, I want to think that the defense department, you know, has all these wonderful like black box programs and things <laughs> and all of these different weapon systems and all that we don't know about and all that. And I want those programs abundantly funded. I, I, as a taxpayer, I want loads of money going into those things that are going to keep us globally competitive and safe and all of that. And so, you know, I would think that, that, that Congress would have the same interest, but it sounds like there's, did you, were you able to have, did you have champions in Congress? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. As a matter of fact, uh, we had a a letter that was signed. It was um, in both the House and the Senate and by Democrats and Republicans alike that signed on that said, uh, you, haven't, you haven't even given this role the same chance as a startup company mm. for crying out loud. Look at the results. Look at the trajectory. Don't do this. But when you have a massive bill, and certain things get tucked in. It's unfortunately, uh, it got swept up in the passage of the NDAA. Mm. But you're absolutely right. When you're looking at, at the very least, flat budgets, if not shrinking budgets, we still have our 
known adversaries, Russia and China, that we have to contend with and watching their economies change and how they're gearing up and, and the work that they're doing. But let's talk about the emerging threats in new domains. We've got cyber issues. We've got biological issues. Those are new domains that we have to make sure, to your point, Tom, that we're funding those new areas and we're not playing catch up. We need to be ahead of the curve and leading because the best, you know, the, the best place to be is preventing issues and not reacting to them. My next question was going to be, what are your concerns for the future? Is, is that it? Or do you, have, do you have more concerns about sort of like what happens to the, what happens to the effort to try to find more efficiencies? Um, do you feel from what you have seen in the Pentagon that, that our military is in good shape right now? Or are we behind the curve? How do you feel about those things? You know, we have a very strong military and we have reason to be very proud of the military. But that's today and day to day things change. And as I mentioned, some of those emerging domains that become threats to our national security don't, don't take days off. Those will continue to ramp up. And so that's what concerns me is number one, will we be able to fund the high priorities that are absolutely necessary to continue to defend this great nation? Number two, not only having the resources, but can we do it at a pace? You know, agility is a big issue as well. Can we do it at a pace where we're staying in front and not playing, where we're playing offense and not defense? Absolutely, I am, uh, you know, we, we do have to modernize. The, the beauty part of the role that I had was prior to my coming on board, um, we didn't know we had 355 separate cloud initiatives. I had that bird's eye view and we were able to make some of those um, baselines so that we knew how to improve. I actually hired the first chief data officer for the Department of Defense. We didn't even have a job description for a data analyst when I got there. So not only making best use of resources, but being a modern fighting organization and a modern defense organization keeps me up. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and I think about the people component too. Uh, I've got a lot of really talented folks and I've actually heard where because the disillusion of the CMO office was handled so poorly, I actually still have people that um, don't have a desk to go to every day. Mm -hmm. So I worry about things from uh, the greater the big picture and the greater good of the country and still think about my team every day. So I'm going to ask you a couple more questions and then I'm going to turn it over to others. You just use the word disillusionment. Are you disillusioned coming, <laughs> coming out of government service? Would, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Would, would you go back into that same position in a different administration? You know, if I could pick up where I left off, you bet. We were doing great work. We were starting to challenge business models within DOD. Uh, I was actually frustrated with hearing people tell me, well, we don't have a profit motive. And I said, maybe we should, because all that money is, can be you know, used differently. It was an amazing experience. I have a great appreciation for the challenges uh, within the building, outside the building. I saw a lot of really good, smart, talented people trying to, in earnest, make good decisions. But the bureaucracy whether that's people, whether that's policies, whether that's even systems that we have to rely on are so incredibly outdated. Um, it's a shame, but we did some great work and I, it, it would be fun to continue, it really would, because I knew we were on a great path and that the trajectory was, you know, 37 billion was huge and we were looking at doubling that in either short, even shorter amounts of time. Mm. Okay, I'm going to try to restrain myself and ask only one more question, and then we'll okay. we'll turn it we'll turn it over to others. I want to go back to the sequester, because we here at IPI were big fans of the sequester. Uh, it was a very very blunt tool, but we thought blunt tools were called for, mm -hmm. and it, it's you know in in my policy lifetime, it's like the only effort to restrain the growth of federal spending that has ever succeeded. Okay. 
but of course, where the where the where the uh, where the dam broke was Republicans saying that they were concerned about harms to the defense budget, and and you have assented to that. You've said that that was the, that you agreed with that. The the whole idea of forcing departmental cuts is to say you have to cut, but you can decide how and when you cut. Right? Why is it that at at DoD? the sequester forced this thing that you describe as like across the board cuts. I mean, did DOD not have the ability to sort of decide where to cut and where not to cut? Or was that another example of Congress sort of um, micromanaging things? No, they had, they absolutely had the ability. And I can't speak to those that were in leadership roles, um, you know, at that time. Mm. But what I found is there was a, a, you know, what you described is exactly how things are run in the private sector. Here's the goal. Here's the outcome that I want. And I'm going to give you the authority to enact that the way you see fit. Unfortunately, um, we, unfortunately, you didn't necessarily have people that knew how to manage a budget that way. They don't necessarily have the uh, insight or any experience to compare it to something else. Uh, we get stuck in the way we've always done things and across the board cuts have always been the way things have been handled. So we fall into those, this is how it's always been done. But you've also got to look at, I, the, again, the massive and complex organization has a lot of fixed costs that are sometimes difficult to overcome. And so it would take, you know, you've got salaries, you've got healthcare, you've got all of those things. It's a very complex uh, organization, which is why they need someone to run management and oversight over that all the time. So I think the sequestration, you're right, it, it imposed discipline but there wasn't anything there to sustain it. And I, I will, I'll use a quote from a, a, uh, uh, someone in leadership in the, in the house said, Lisa, this was one of my supporters. He said, Lisa, I don't want all the people at DOD thinking about reform and modernization some of the time. I want a high ranking official who eats, sleeps and drinks that all of the time so that they can keep their finger on the pulse and not make it a part-time endeavor. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Matthews, do you have any questions? Um, I will restrict it to one. Thank you, Lisa. Very, very good. Interesting presentation. Uh, several years, uh, well, a few years ago, a friend of mine, an economist who was, uh, was working in the labor department for a while, and uh, we were talking about it. And I, and I asked him, I said, how, how many people do you think are there that you could that they could essentially eliminate and you wouldn't actually have a problem. He, and without without missing a beat, he said fifty percent. He said I think you could let fifty percent of them go and it wouldn't hurt the workflow and in fact might actually improve the workflow. And this is a problem with large bureaucracies. People come in, change jobs, change and so forth. They don't want to leave and and other things. That, do do you feel that the Pentagon in terms of employees is somewhat bloated or, or and and could you come up with some kind of general estimate if, if we cut out this many people it would still work well and we would save a lot of money we actually you know it's a fair question and and uh, i've heard that number too 50 percent is something that i think has been floated around often it's very difficult to assign a number because we haven't really done a good job at assigning the outcomes and so uh, and I'll give you a, for example, when I was reviewing the 6.2 billion in savings, I required 70 million in investment. And uh, leadership looked at me and said, how many headcount do you get for that? And I said, what? And they said, well, I wanna know, well, how many headcount come with the contract? And I said, what are you talking about? We don't measure in headcount. We're, you know, we're looking to get outcomes from it. So I would say it's tough to assign a number. I do think that running day-to-day -day typical operations, we probably have too many people. When you're talking about emerging threats and emerging you know, um, uh, advanced technologies, we don't have enough. 
Right. I think the real gap is less about headcount and more about talent. It is very hard to attract talent and keep talent. I, I mentioned that I hired the first chief data officer. I'm competing with the private sector for data scientists coming out of school who are getting top dollar. I can't, I can't pay top, top dollar. I am very, very limited and I have to have certain hiring authorities to hire those people. So I had to, I looked at um, uh, mathematicians who have similar skill sets and looked at training them. And I actually targeted mid-career data scientists and said, if you're looking for a big, hairy, audacious pro problem to work on, I've got them in spades. So, I, and I'm sorry, I'm not actually trying to skirt your question. It's a valid question, but I think it's more on what do we need in terms of advancement, advanced thinking, um, advanced technology, and we're shaking those paradigms all the time. I had a great conversation with our former secretary of the Air Force, Barbara Barrett, and she said, you know, we look at recruiting for Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Guard, you know, young, fit individuals. She said, you know who would have been an outstanding member of Space Force? Stephen Hawking. So you think about those paradigm shifts and the areas of technology and science and uh, bio and those areas, it's more about experience and how we have to make that shift. And, and you bring up a good point too. The people that have been there for a very, very long time don't necessarily have those external experiences, which I think we're absolutely craving now at DOD. That's really interesting because you're right. The, the emerging threats are all high tech, right? Yeah. It's yeah. cybersecurity, it's biological. And those people probably see greater career opportunities and, you know, earnings opportunities are greater in the private sector than working for the federal government. So there's probably some, you know, some labor policy adjustments that need to be made in the Department of Defense too. You know, I, you know we've all seen that science fiction movie, you know, where, you know, a black helicopter shows up and like the top, you know, the top scientist, whatever in the world suddenly gets commandeered by the Department of Defense, you know, to deal with the alien threat or whatever. But I mean, you really do want the top people, don't you? And, you and it's hard to get the top people if you can't pay. You bet, but we have a great opportunity. And I think COVID actually presented us with an impetus to fundamentally change the way we do business at DOD. When I walked in, I asked them how many people work from home and I, they looked at me and they said, well, nobody. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, we work in classified information. I said, all the time? <laughs> Suddenly we went from 25,000 in the building to 5,000. It felt like a ghost town. Mm -hmm. We have found that people have more of a calling and we've seen this go up in terms of interest after, uh, post COVID in doing more work that creates value, that has a purpose behind it, that has a mission. My goodness, there's no better place than DOD to answer that calling. And I think there's plenty of opportunities, but we need to pay attention to the things they do in the private sector, like recruitment and talent development and identifying high potentials within the department and giving them opportunities to play different roles to increase their level of expertise and their learning. There is so much from a talent management standpoint that needs significant attention. Okay, well, we do have a number of questions. Um, uh, I have an anonymous question here that you just sort of alluded to a moment ago. Did you need to get a security clearance in order to do your job? Oh, yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I had to be, uh, I had to have a pre-clearance before I could even start uh, and step foot in the building. It's very interesting on your very first day before you can log in to your system the first time, you also have to be sworn in. Mm. So they do an informal ceremony um, so that you can start. But yes, I had to have a pre-clearance and then a full-blown, um, full top secret clearance to do my job. 
Well, they, they must have accelerated yours because I know people who have been waiting for six to nine months to get a security clearance. So it may be that if you're the third highest ranking person in the Pentagon, they accelerate your security clearance. <laughs> There's some truth to that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we have a question from Dennis McQuiston. Uh, I think you've already mostly answered this. Dennis wants to know, is there a new person in your old position? Well, no, because the position has been eliminated. But he asks, what do you think will happen in the future? What, what, do you think, what do you think is the potential for continued efficiency gains along the lines of what you were setting in motion? So it's, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a very somber one for me because uh, they, what they did was they took pieces of my organization and put them in different places. So we lost some of that cohesiveness and that, um, you know, alignment and synchronization that we had uh, with the team, which is challenging. My, you know, so, and some of it went um, to organizations that even in the private sector, we wouldn't recommend reform being uh, run from. And that's no disrespect to the leaders of those organizations. But even when I was in my consulting practice, I said, look, it's very difficult to run reform um, from a financial organization because everyone assumes everything is nothing more than a cut. Mm. And even if it's not, it's that perception. So, uh, they've, they've split it up into separate organizations. There is no one authority that is focused on this uh, every single day. The deputy secretary role has as part of the role uh, the title of COO, but candidly, we don't specifically recruit for that type of a background. So I think there are some challenges ahead. Uh, there have been some wonderful folks in Congress who said, we're not done. Um, we have every intention on starting the works to bring this back. You know, this, even with the DCMO, they started as far back as 2005 to try to get this right. It was just unfortunate that the moment they did get it right, uh, it was given only about three years. Yeah, okay. I want to give my colleague Addie Crimmins a chance to ask any questions she may have. Addie, did you have a question? I don't, and my internet's being funny, so I don't want to okay. waste anybody's time. Okay, very good. So we, have, we do have some other questions. We have a question from Sean Kennedy. He's with Citizens Against Government, Government Waste. So he was probably, he and his organization were undoubtedly one of your fans. They were wonderful. And, and uh, we at IPI have enjoyed their work over the years in identifying wasteful programs and amazingly strange things that it doesn't seem like the federal government should be spending money on. And, and Sean's question is, is similar to a couple of things we've talked about. With the unfortunate decision to disestablish the CMO role, how do you see future DOD reform efforts progressing? How much of a setback is this? I think you've already kind of answered that. It seems to me it's a pretty big setback, at least for now. You know, Sean, it's a fair question. And if history is any guide, um, it's always been underfunded, not given the right authority, and candidly has limped along. I mean, as far back as when the Truman Committee was put together, it went from 1941 to 1948. They made some progress, but they disestablished it. And, uh, you know, things were not sustained. You go back to the DCMO role that was prior to the CMO. And I mean, they didn't even bother filling the position for 60% of the 10 years that it was in place. So I'm not, in, I, I'm, I'm discouraged about what will happen in the future. I think that people will make uh, siloed decisions on cuts. I think that there is still an tremendous amount of opportunity for overlap. Like I said, when you've got 64 CIOs in place, and again, this is not that they're bad people, but they're working in their lane and there's not that opportunity to you know, bring together what's happening and have a one, uh, a single strategy that works. So I'm, I am deeply concerned about what this will mean. Uh, our friend Carl Zebarth has asked more of a macro question. 
and I just want to acknowledge that there may be some questions you can't answer, right, okay. for, for yeah. security reasons or whatever. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but Carl's concern is a more macro concern. We hear these stories about the, what is it, the F-35 program having huge problems. Mm -hmm. we, hear, we hear about some Navy warship problems and things like that. And Carl's concerns are, are we in a position right now to, to fight a multi-front war? Are we in a position right now to, to fight a two-front war uh, with where we are? So from a more macro standpoint, um, are, are you confident in our war fighting capacity right now? You know, um, there's always room for improvement, but I will say that we've made uh, great strides. And again, this is knowing the folks that I worked with in my time there, they were, um, they were trying to make significant advances. What has happened through the transition, I can't speak to, so I don't know, but I know that we were very doggedly talking about those issues. We were transparent about those issues. We were co continually engaging with our, our vendors and our subcontractors to say, how do we work together to fix this and put, you know, hold them accountable. So I'm hoping that that work continues because a lot of good work has been done and it was encouraging to see the direction that we were going. Okay, great. And then we have a question. Well, let's see, we just had another one come in. And again, this may be a little bit outside your, your area of expertise, um, but David Cam wonders if Chinese and Russian military operations have some of the same similar inefficiencies and problems that we have. Um, you know, I can't speak for that uh, firsthand because I've, you know, I've not been able to, you know, peek, peek under the tent, but I would say that I'm sure that they face very similar uh, challenges, whether it's, you know, talent, whether it's scaling, whether it's the right resources, Be, you know, and, and because I've seen many of the similar thing, similar challenges in the private sector, even when I worked in different countries, I would guess that uh, government's probably no different. Yeah, government's government, right? <laughs> as, as bad as ours is, it's probably, probably in the upper 10%. <laughs> yeah. And then we have a question from Leon Dixon, who is so impressed with your presentation today. He wants to wonder, he wonders how your husband Brant ever wins any arguments at home. <laughs> Leon, it's probably best I don't answer that. I was just going to say, it's probably best you don't answer that. It's probably best you don't answer that. <laughs> Thank you for the kind uh, kind words. I appreciate it. Well, Lisa, I have to say that um, one of the things about the Trump administration in retrospect that was most impressive was bringing you on board oh, and, you. and putting you in the, in the Defense Department and the accomplishments that you made. I'm only sorry that you weren't there long enough to have an even more long-lasting effect but uh, hopefully we'll have other opportunities in the future uh, to put your talents back to work for the good of the country and, and, and uh, for all of us as taxpayers. And I, I, this has been a really interesting and fascinating discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much oh. for agreeing to do it. My pleasure. Uh, and you know, you know, we're very fond of you and Brant and if there's any way we can ever be helpful in the future, we're happy to do that. But thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate well, it. Thank you. Thanks for helping or inviting me to do this and IPI keep doing what you're doing. You do great work. And it's a, it was a privilege to be a part of your forum today. Thank you. You're very kind. And I want to thank all of our participants and all of our viewers who've been with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and until life returns to normal or semi-normal, this is how we do our policy events and briefings now, but it works. It gives us access to a, a nationwide and sometimes even international audience. And so we, we're delighted to have the technology and the innovation that allows us to do this. Uh, we will be doing uh, more such policy briefings probably about every two weeks in the future. So uh, sign up on our website if you'd like to be notified about more events. If you have any questions, uh, you can direct them to Addie Crimmins, Addie at IPI.org, and she'll be delighted to help you with that. So without any further ado, again, thank you, Lisa, and thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you have a great afternoon.